Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word, a walk through Revelation. We had kind of walked through the first 11 chapters, got through the teachings of Christ. Now we come up to the 12th chapter, which covers a longer span of, of time than probably than most uh, chapters in the, the Bible itself. So in a way, if you are under the opinion or that the book of Revelation goes from chapter 1 through 22 chronologically in time, not so, because it covers a segment and then backs out and then here we go again. Now we're going to go all the way back into the first earth age when Satan deceived a third of God's children. You find that and then uh, Satan is cast from heaven and tries to deceive the woman, the church. And then people say that the church isn't mentioned after chapter 4 and that's, that's just not true. For the woman is symbolic of the church being the true followers of Christ. Satan tries to drown her with his flood of lies. Naturally, we don't have to worry about it because we know the truth. And the reason you note in this 12th chapter, and we ask that word of wisdom from our Father, that Satan appears um, as a, in verse 3, and there appeared another wonder after seeing the woman with the 12, the crown with the 12 stars, being meaning symbolic of Mother Israel. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, the same one we'll read about in the 13th chapter, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. You'll notice that he only has seven crowns here, whereas in this earth age he will have ten, as it is written in the 13th chapter. And his tail, in verse 4, drew a third part of the stars of heaven. And did, that's a, that is a name for God's children, all right? And did cast them to the earth, or caused them to be placed here on earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Of course, that child was Yeshua. And a great length of time goes by and it comes up to the end. And then in verse 7 of that chapter 12, and there was a war in heaven, not on earth, but in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil. I wonder if you know who this is. Called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, you will note in this 12th chapter, as we delivered at a Passover message this, uh, earlier this year, that each of those names is utilized for a part that he plays in the deception of the woman. But the most important thing is the woe, listen to it. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, he's gone, all right? And ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, being one of the woe trumpets, and to of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. That short time is a five-month period that we covered in chapter 9 of this great book. Now, Satan's spirit can walk the earth today, that's to say evil spirits, but Satan himself cannot. He's held captive by Michael. But when the Antichrist appears, the son of perdition, there's only one and this is he, he will be cast to this earth and he will be give, given the freedom to deceive those that have not grown familiar with their father's word because of lack of love for him to care about the warnings that he um, 
uh, allowed to precede the fact. That is to say, Jesus, as he would say many times, Behold, I have foretold you all things. That is written in the 13th chapter of Mark where he warns of the coming of this false Messiah. Anyway, the dragon chases the woman into the wilderness and certainly God gives her strength. Why? All you have to have is the truth and Satan's lies don't affect you in the least. And um, that um, the people of that time in the 17th verse, read of it, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, children, which keep the commandments of God. They're not deceived and they know God's word and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That we do. Now then comes the great 13th chapter of the great book of Revelation. Within that 13th chapter, we have the formation of Satan's equivalent government that is allowed to form. God doesn't deal with multi-headed monsters, all right? Anytime you hear that, it's political. And he allows him and the peoples, even in the evil spirit, to almost bring together a one-world political system called one-worldism. And it receives a deadly wound, not to a person necessarily, but to the system itself. But presto, Michael cast heaven, uh, from heaven the dragon, and he is able, that is to say Satan, the false Christ, he's able to perform enough miracles that people thinking that Christ has returned to rapture them away, they're going to be raptured all right into the depth, um, or fa fair enough, then certainly it becomes successful and as we'll find in the 17th chapter for one hour. And that one hour is symbolic of a five month period of time. It is the hour of temptation of which you shall escape. But um, he performs many miracles. I would say he it is said he has 42 months. All prophecies given towards Satan are months, meaning moons, meaning of the night. Prophecies given towards God's children are days, all right, are light, a thing that you want to be sure and remember. Now, the political system, in as much as it doesn't get it done, we see a wonderful thing or an amazing thing happens in the 11th verse. Listen to it. And I beheld another beast, being, all right, coming out of the earth or making power up on the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. He looked like Jesus Christ, the lamb slain, but he spake as a dragon. Why? Because it is the dragon trying to play little Jesus. Verse 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast, I'm in the 12th verse of the 13th chapter of Revelation, before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, the world political religious system whose deadly wound was healed. Who healed it? He did, just with his appearance. Why? And, the great, uh, and he doeth great wonders. All people are amazed at supernatural wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, that's going to be real impressive. And people that are not studied nor learned in our Father's Word are going to think, going to believe, that this is Christ when he's able to perform miracles like snapping his fingers and fire or lightning coming from heaven. 14, and he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles. How does he do it? Impressing them with the miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And naturally you know that they would receive this. What is an image? You're looking at one when you look at television. Well, when he um, revitalizes that one world system and tells them to become a part, and all you have to do to do that is worship him, and um, that way you can buy and sell, but others would uh, have that mark in there. It's just, a mark in the hand simply means to do his work. And so it is. Now, the last warning concerning this is we find in the 18th verse. Here is wisdom. When you hear that, perk up. All right, listen. 
Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Why? Because it is a man. It is an angelic being, a cherubim called Satan in man's appearance. That may throw some of you to call a cherubim by the name of man, but what does Gabriel mean in the Hebrew tongue? Man of God. All right? And the word count is stone or using stones worn smooth over a long period of time. That's what the Greek is. It is akin to that new stone that you are given, which lets you partake of the hidden manna, meaning that you're able to count the Kenites from the, why it states that fi early figs, because in the fig garden, where the dastardly act took place from the beginning, it has been watched and observed by utilizing the key of David, whereby you're not deceived. And it's in the forehead. What's in your forehead? Your brain. So use it. Satan is much shrewder than to paint 666 on a bunch of people's heads. What it means is at the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial, the Antichrist shall appear. It will not be until the seventh that the true Christ appears. So never let man deceive you about that. Now, chapter 14 and 15 are interesting. Chapter 14 speaks again of those 144,000 spoken of in the seventh chapter. It is written to, concerning the earth. Chapter 15 is written concerning heaven. All right? 14 earth, 15 heaven. It tells of their overcoming, and it calls that 144,000 virgins, so to speak. Why? Because when God's elect are delivered, that church of Smyrna we read of, put on trial, and the Holy Spirit speaks through them, that 144,000 happens to be the people that many times you've planted seed with and they didn't come forth. But when they see what you stated come to pass, then they shall. Another interesting thing is in this chapter 14, you will note in verse 13, a very important point. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed, this is chapter 14, verse 13. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works. I repeat, their works do follow them. Your works are the only thing that you can take with you and they are your rewards in the book of life. And then, of course, at this time, the true Christ on earth puts the sickle in and the harvest begins, all right? Chapter 15 is a blessed chapter in as much as it does concern heaven. And we see these people that are on their way to meet the Lord and they're singing a song, and it's the song of Moses, as you find in, chapter, in the third verse of that 15th chapter. And, of course, the Song of Moses is written in Deuteronomy chapter 32. You should know that song because you're going to be singing it if you are one of those that overcome. It is the entire story based in one song, uh, less than one full chapter long, giving the word uh, to the wise and a song that is, brings glory to our Father for those that pay attention to the teachings of our Father. And then, of course, the last thing that happens in verse 8, the temple is sealed because the millennium begins. And those that overcome after the millennium begins must wait until the end of the thousand years, naturally, because they are tested. Now, in chapter 16, we see in, in this um, the uh, voice of the people in the temple praising God. We see the vials begin to be poured out. And again, they are the seals, trumpets, and vials are all the same. It just gives you a different profile and a different look. And of course, it takes us on up to that time of verse 16. He gathered them together in a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon, which Megiddo, Megiddon is Megiddo. It means the gathering place of the crowd. What crowd? Satan's crowd, of course. And it is they that the vial is poured out upon, not us, all right? 
And then in chapter 17, you have one of the most important chapters in the book of Revelation to identify the woman, not the woman that Satan tried to destroy, but the woman that hopped on his back. And she is none other than that great harlot that rides that world system thinking that he is Jesus come to rapture them out. It's a real sad situation. Satan is identified in verse 8 of this great chapter. And um, he comes out of the bottomless pit. And um, he deceives all whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Make sure that you know. Make sure. And it continues then giving the various roles that Satan plays in, down uh, through the years. And as it lists the king that, and the roles, Satan, serpent, dragon. Those are roles. But it identifies him again in the 11th verse, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Meaning they're all the same. And perdition is what? Those that perish, meaning it could not be stated in that light, else they had already been judged to death by God himself. That's only one, and that is Satan. All right? And it, uh, interesting again, that when that son of perdition does come as Antichrist and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings on this earth which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with that particular beast, that Antichrist, that one hour of temptation. But remember again from chapter 9, that is a five month period of time. And do you know who the woman is? Verse 18. The woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. What does Babylon mean? Confusion. The woman is the one that is confused over the world at that time as to who the true Christ is. What is the sea that this thing rises from? Verse 15 of this 17th chapter. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest were where the whore sitteth are the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. In other words, it sits upon the people, this harlot, false religion, false teaching, and deceives them into worshiping the son of perdition, thinking that he is true Messiah. That's going to be a sad moment. I, I, do I feel sorry for them? Yes, I do. It is sad, but be that as it may. Chapter 18. We have within it um, that uh, great Babylon, that harlot sitting there, and she states, I am a queen. I'm not a widow. Well, the bride of Christ is a widow, so to speak, until Christ returns. That's why she is barren. That's why she is without child, as Christ reiterated that even while he was carrying the cross up that hill of Golgotha. And... God says, double her cup to her double. In other words, she's going to get the punishment in verse 6. It is stated, reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works and the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double and then make her drink it. All right? Got it? The cup will be poured upon her. And of course, the seventh verse is where she says, I'm a queen. I'm not a widow. Why? She says her husband is with her when the false Christ is here. What are you going to say? You know, there's two women symbolizing the bride of Christ or should be bride of Christ because God hopes it is his will that all come to repentance. They're not. But in which camp are you going to be? That's what's important. And they celebrate uh, the old uh, girl and... Uh, and this is both men and women. I want to make that very clear. There's no gender in this, even though these, uh, these figures of speech are utilized. And they weep and cry, the Kenites do, when, they're, when their great city of trade, of deception, is taken from them. And that happens in this 18th chapter. Now we come to the 19th chapter, a fascinating chapter because it is in this chapter that after these things that Christ is ready to take his bride. And uh, we focus in then on that time that the true God is praised. And in the, in the 19th chapter, 
in this seventh verse, we read a, a very interesting statement. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. So we have a bride and a wife. Who is this wife? Well, think also that God chose some before the foundations of the earth and justified them as it is written in Romans uh, chapter 8. And to her in verse 8 was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. This is a bridal garment, okay? Clean and white for the fine linen is, this tells you what forms the linen that you will wear in heaven, is the righteousness of saints. That is to say God's elect that commit righteous acts makes up the fine linen that you wear in heaven. That's why he said some of you would be naked. That is to say, back when he was speaking to the churches, speaking specifically to that old Jezebel. What an interesting book, this book of Revelation, the unveiling. Again, I want to say never, never let a man tell you that this book is not to be understood. It's one of the most, it is, it is a very simple book. If you listen to the word rather than what men say from many of the so-called teaching units, churches. And then another white horse appears that is the exact opposite of the white horse that appeared in Revelation chapter 6, verse 11 of this 19th chapter. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Christ is coming back to make war. War against who? The enemy, Satan. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Listen. And he was clothed with a vesta dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's why we can call Jesus the Word of God. He is the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. With him comes many of your grandparents, your mothers and fathers that have gone on that were true servants. Paul, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and on the list goes. What a normie that's going to be. Fifteen, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, the same one identified in Revelation 1, 15 and 16, which would smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. God is not happy with the world conditions. We have, and of course, he hath on his vesta and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is our Savior, the one who paid the price, who allowed the enemy to crucify him on a cross whereby you and I could attain salvation or whosoever will, even a Kenite, if they choose salvation. He has the power to forgive and then rather than children that are tares, they become children of God, much as, as um, any one of the free will peoples would have. Our Father is really good to His children. He created each and every one for His pleasure. It does not give Him much pleasure when, when spin doctors spin off truth and play in the land of fiction of lies and false stories to mislead people, but the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is going to correct it. And he's not going to do it with a, uh, I will pray for you. He's going to do it with an iron rod, all right? Spiritually speaking, it shall happen. And at that time, the battle begins. And here's a very interesting thing in verse 20 of that chapter. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, 
That is to say, the world political system and the role of Antichrist. These are roles and systems, not individuals, okay? And that wrought miracles before him, that's to say the false Messiah beginning with Re verse 11 of Revelation 13, before him, which, with which he deceived them that had, de had received the mark of the beast, that's to say in their forehead received the lie, that thinking that this is the true Christ when he's a fake, and them that worshiped his image, that's to say the system, his church, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. This is even before the millennium begins. They're cast in there. And uh, of course the remnant, a remnant, the, um, the fa fallen angels of Genesis 6 are destroyed when the two witnesses rise from the street of Jerusalem. This is all uh, happens basically at the same time. So when Satan is released a short season, as we'll find here in a moment, he will no longer have the comfort of being allowed to come as a false messiah or develop any political system. First seven crowns, then ten, this time zilch, zero, nada, all right? And God will destroy him the moment that he attacks God's children and whoever are with him at the end of the millennium. 20th chapter, millennium period. Again, an angel appears and he has the key to the bottomless pit. And I have no doubt in my mind that this angel is Michael. There's no, uh, there no proof of it, but I, I, I'm sure that it is. And he laid hold on the old dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, giving the roles of Satan and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And um, the nations were taught with the influence of Satan or anything negative totally away. There are many people that have never had an opportunity to learn the truth. And they have been told, believe this or believe that, and have been deceived. There have been many people that are handicapped to a point whereby they did not have a chance to learn the full rich depth of God's Word. Bear in mind that the seventh trump, we're all changed into a spiritual body and have full recovery of our spiritual minds, knowing and understanding. And how many do you think will be deceived at the end of the thousand years? It is written that the rest of the dead must remain dead until the end of the thousand years. That's why the temple is sealed at that time. Because it means spiritually dead, not physically dead, because they're all in spiritual bodies, some of them though having a mortal soul and some having an immortal. And it will be according to when Satan is released at the end of this chapter for a short period. If they still remain true, they will take part in the second resurrection. Those that overcome have no part in the second resurrection because they participate in the first. Now everybody participates in the first death, that is the death of the flesh or the change. But not everybody will participate in the second death. The second death is perdition. You read of it in verse 14 of this great 20th chapter after the great white throne judgment. God is a consuming fire. Verse 14 reads, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Fini. Fear not he that can kill your flesh body, but he that can cause your soul to perish forever and ever and ever in ashes in the lake of fire. It's going to be a bad time, but yet a good time, because all that is evil will be cleansed from this earth. And then in chapter 21, we see a refurbishing. This age passes at that time. The millennium is a part of this age, not dispensation, but age. But chapter 21 begins with a new earth age. And this new earth age 
has no sorcerer, sorcerer being a pharmaceuta, which means drugs, no murderers, no liars. They're gone. Thank God they're gone. And we see a beautiful new earth. We see a new kingdom with the true Lord of Lords and King of Kings over that kingdom. And we see, as it were, no temple within that city. Verse 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need for, of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Comparing the brightness, you understand. Listen carefully. You have the tribes of Israel situate there within, but what's this? And the nations, ethnos, of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth. What's this? Kings besides the king of kings? Yes. We're in the, we're in the eternity here. It is the kings and queens of the ethnos people that love the Lord Jesus Christ and they will lead their people even in the eternity. What an opportunity to live in this generation. And the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it and the gates of it shall not be shut all at, by day for there shall be no night there. For what? We're children of the day. And so it is as we go into that 22nd chapter, that the tree of life is situate there. The tree of life that gives forth 12 manners of fruit. And that 12 manners of fruit being the healing leaves of the nations and the people. What is the tree of life? It's Jesus Christ, Yeshua. And again, not a tear, nothing to disturb. Now, many would believe and do teach that the churches are not mentioned after the fourth chapter, but what you want to do is really take in the 16th verse of this 22nd chapter. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. That's what it's about. And he continues on. Don't change one word of this. Of course, it was written in a different language, the original language, and it has been translated to English for you, whereby you could read. Therefore, you must at times go back to the original to understand. Many will be blotted out of that book. And if any man, 19, shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written, blotted out forever. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Amen means that's the way it is. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We're, I think we're ready for that time. I think we're approaching that time. And that's one reason I wanted to take this walk through the book of Revelation. Not that it was an in-depth teaching, not chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but you have that available in audio as well as video. We show it at times. You need to keep abreast. Nothing shall happen that he has not foretold us of. He has foretold us of this beautiful creature that he states in Ezekiel 28 that he made the full pattern, meaning, boy, he looks like a savior, but he's wicked, and his name is Satan, called Tyrus in that particular chapter, meaning rock, but not our rock, which you will learn in the Song of Moses from the 15th chapter of Revelation, going back to Deuteronomy 32 giving the difference in the rocks, the stone, Tyrus. Our rock that we build upon is our Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. Better check your stones out. How do you find out? In the Word of God. Book of Revelations, a walkthrough. I hope you enjoyed that. It's a fascinating thing. Always remember, Revelation means not to hide 
but the unveiling or to uncover or to make known in any language you want to say it in. So never keep it hid from your mind. Absorb it. It's a beautiful book. Revelation. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please? The book of James. James is a book that I know you'll enjoy because it is written when you rightly divide it to those that are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad, being very specific in your freedom of Christianity, the repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity uh, defining those things that come from the Word of God. Example, that uh, bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same spring. Well, from God's Word, you should not have both either. The practice of healing brought forth in this book of James. I know you're going to like it. James, that great book of instruction. All right, bless your hearts. There we are back again. Say, it's good to be with you as always. There's our 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Please never ask a question about an individual or organization or anything of that nature. Let's just stick with God's Word. Uh, we can no longer answer all questions because we're in over 100 million homes around the world. But hey, that's fantastic. And if the Spirit works it, there it will be. Now, those of you that listen by short wave around the world, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request? He's your Father. He loves you. He hears you. And he will answer your prayers according to what is best for you. If you love him, that's the only thing you would ask anyway. That he give you what is best for you, for he knows. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, Father, heal in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, let's get right into some questions here. And we find Laverne from Wisconsin. I told my children never to hate anyone. Was I wrong? Should we hate someone who hates God? Well, that's a, you know, uh, hate is a terrible thing, but yet at the same time, Satan, we must hate because he destroys our brothers and sisters. He will even destroy your children if he gets a chance. I hope you would hate him for that reason. It would be according to the age of the children, number one. But we are not to hate those that particularly hate God as individuals that are ignorant, don't know any better. That's what we were sent here for, is to help people that need help. Um, I would suggest that you teach your children the third chapter of 2 Thessalonians as to how to handle a brother that's God's way, okay? That's to say the third chapter of 2 Thessalonians, beginning with about verse 6. Christopher from Virginia. I heard you talking about Ezekiel and God's chariots for his throne. What about the sightings of UFOs today and the people that say they have been abducted by UFOs? Do you think these UFOs are from God or somewhere else? Uh, I don't believe most of them. Just because God's Word speaks of uh, flying vehicles, and yes, God's throne was aboard one, but those vehicles, you must also remember, Satan will be cast from heaven in one. You may never see it. Uh, again, I would caution you in that teaching, and I don't, I don't like to talk on this too much because a lot of people like to make a religion out of this, uh, Christopher. But, so I'll let this answer all the questions that are asked about that. It's according to who's operating it as to whether it's good or evil. Um, certainly that will be part of the miracles that God will al allow Satan to perform to check out and see who's done their homework. 
have people been abducted? Well, if they tell you they've been abducted by little squeegee board guys, hey, that I, no way, all right? Because they don't look that way. That we know from God's Word too. Okay, enough said. John from Arkansas. On the sixth trump, do the fallen angels come down with Satan or do they precede him and work the one world system? No, they come with him. They're cast out at the same time. Uh, we've got enough evil spirits among people to try to work the one world system right now. New world order and so forth. Oh, we get lots of that. The communists thought they had it made. They were going to fix a new world order. Only they had to kill off about half the population when they took a place over. That sure wasn't very Christian, was it? Or, oh, pardon me, communists don't believe in God, so couldn't be Christian, could it? So, uh, just you've got enough socialist in the world today, which is a form of that. They don't really believe. I, I don't want to brand all that uh, like to think in the sense of socialism as uh, anti-God, but basically communism is the mother of socialism. So you're, you've got a brand of it. So just be alert, be alert. Scott from California. Are there any scriptures besides Revelation that talk about the two witnesses? Oh yes. You will, you will read um, a great deal about them in Zechariah chapter 4. And I would tell you that in the Hebrew tongue, they are known as the sons of oil, no gender intended. But naturally, the anointed is Christ. That's what the word means. And they are the anointed sons of oil. And they will produce and put forth a, a great deal of truth in those final days and hours that all of us will be able to gain from. It's gonna, you know, we live in a very precious generation, the generation of the fig tree that was established and set out in the year of our Lord, 1948. And it was really placed in place in 1967. And it's getting some years on it. It's interesting as we watch. And many things have happened and from one day to the next, never is it the same as the spin doctors and everyone begin to ply their trade, all right? Frank from Texas, is there any place in the Bible that says Satan created anything? Also, is there an unforgivable sin? I'll take the last verse. Yes, there is an unforgivable sin. And Luke chapter 12, verse 10 stipulates that it is God's election when they're delivered up before the false Christ, if they bend to him, that's unforgivable. Only God's elect can commit the unforgivable sin. Satan has never, can never, and will never create anything in the sense of the word creativity. He's caused a lot of things. I repeat, he causes a lot of things, and he's a copycat. He makes things seem as they are not. But to create, no way. He is not a creator. He cannot give life. He only destroys and he creates a mess, all right? Only properly causes a mess everywhere. Just make sure you don't let him cause a mess in your life. Chuck from Illinois, Bullinger's work, Figures of Speech. Do you recommend it? Well, it's not a bad work. Um, I, I like Lamps's uh, uh, words on idioms as well, which uh, is, you kind of get, which is Aramaic, for those of you that may not know. Um, the idioms that those that spoke the Aramaic language uh, utilized, and you can learn a great deal from those also. The figures of speech that are a part of the appendix of a companion Bible, what is it, six, I think, I find them interesting. Um, and here we have Oliver, I believe. I have a question that I would like, uh, that, I, I, that I think you will be able to answer. Some, uh, I 
can't make that out. Some people, I'll say, I don't think that's what it, have different names for the Creator. Jehovah, Yahweh, and Yah. But what is the true or correct way to pronounce the Creator's name? Well, it's really real simple to answer because the Creator's name is locked in in the Hebrew manuscripts in the book of Esther in what is known as an acrostic. You English readers can read of that acrostic and have your homework done for you in the Hebrew in an appendix in your companion Bible in the back on acrostics. In other words, the sacred name is locked in where man can't change it. Very few people know this because unfortunately we don't have all that many scholars left in the world. Yahweh is incorrect. And I know a lot of people build religions on that, but I'm sorry, it's not correct. And God's Word locks in the truth. It's Yahweh. Um, to pronounce it correctly, Y-A-H, very small A sound, V-E-H. And the vit is locked in in Esther, and it cannot be W. All right? Wuh. Cannot be. It is, the etymology of the name comes from I am that I am. Iya asha iya. All right? Okay, Corey from Florida. I am concerned about something. Uh, I have an anxiety disorder, and I'm wondering if it is a sin to take medication uh, for it, and he mentions a type or two. I just don't know what to do. Well, Luke was a medical doctor. God, there are many Christian doctors in this world, and you should, uh, if you have a situation where it is needed and is prescribed by a doctor, well, then many of them are Christian, and they pray just like the rest of us do, and they're very good men, much as Luke was. So, of course, God gives us a brain, and he expects us to use it. Never, never allow anything that I would say to pull anyone off their medication, all right? Uh, you must always um, follow what he or she might say if they are doing a good job. I prefer Christian, but then uh, that is your choice. Thomas from Virginia. In Genesis 32, 24, and 26, was Jacob in a physical body or a spiritual body when he wrestled God. He was in his flesh body. Uh, now, why would I say that? Let's document it. Because God touched him, and, and it almost paralyzed him. I make it that the, he touched the sciatic nerve and probably put the fourth lumbar out and that kind of crippled old uh, Jacob up for a little while. He, he wasn't into, he was, was, he wasn't cocky about it. Let's put it that way, okay? And, but God appreciated it, and that's when he changed his name to Israel, uh, the prince that prevail that uh, that um, fights with God. I'll say, Billy from Wisconsin, how do you feel about? donating your body parts. Well, I sure don't want to yet, all right? I'm, I'm, I need all I've got. But if you mean like making a living will to donate them, I think, I think to be able to give someone sight is a beautiful thing. And, if, and this, this is one of those miracles. And again, as I forestated earlier, Luke was a medical doctor. And and uh, it is a process that is just, just makes common sense. These flesh bodies are kind of mechanical in a way. A lot of plumbing going on, you know, like I think I could say that about 80% of the, the uh, medicine we use is common sense. And I personally, myself, would not want a total transplant, say lungs, heart, liver, the whole bit, all right? I, I don't think I would. I think probably the Father would be ready for me to come home on that, but that's only a personal choice. 
I, I think each person must leave it up to themselves. Uh, but um, I, think it, I think there's nothing wrong with being able to give sight and life, like a heart or something of that nature. Um, okay, I, I think I will not put any more of my thought into that. It's, it's okay. Debbie from California. Is Jehovah, is Jehovah God's name? Well, we just answered that, did we? No, it isn't. It is Yahweh. There are no J's in the Hebrew language, all right? And God spoke Hebrew when he told Moses what to call him. Um, I think, I would think that anyone would understand that, uh, that professes to be a scholar, but apparently not. Yahweh. Uh, Bobby from um, California. God said, let us make man in our image. Why did God say us? since the angels could not do this. He said, let us make them in our image, our image. How do you know that the angels couldn't? Um, if God gave them the ability to, they could. Do I know that he did? No, I don't. God's able to handle it all on himself. Us, let us make them in our image. Genesis 1, 26. Don from Oklahoma. Are we all kin to Noah since everyone was destroyed by the flood? They weren't. There were eight Adamic souls that were aboard the ark. All right? That's from the daughters of Adam. All right? Uh, that's how Genesis 6 that begins the flood chapter begins. But Noah was told, you'll read in verse 3 of that sixth chapter of Genesis, that it grieved God that he had made man flesh because he created all of the races on the sixth day. And it was good. He liked every one of them. He made them that way, created them that way. That's the way he wanted them. And he told Noah, you take two of every flesh aboard the ark. Now, Chinese history speaks of the great flood over Mount Ararat, which would indicate that the flood was not uh, over the entire Eretz. And I use that because the word cosmos is used in other places to mean the world system where the fallen angels had interbred with the daughters of Adam and no doubt others. Those he destroyed, all right? But there was two of all flesh aboard that ark. So... Eight Adamic souls, as Peter reiterates. Why would Adamic? Because it was, why would God call special attention to that? Because that would be the line through which Christ would come, the key of David. Bruce from Florida. A lot of pastors say that as far as unclean foods, that was done away with. However, I can't find where God did away with the unclean foods. Who's right, uh, Doc? Government, please. Well, that's easy. God created these flesh bodies, and they're still the same. And something that would make one of these bodies sick um, when he gave Leviticus 11 still will. Many people believe that when God let the sheet of unclean animals come down before Peter, he didn't make Peter eat that junk. He took it back up each time. It was, in the first, it wasn't real. He took it back to heaven, and unclean animals are not in heaven, uh, that is to say. And um, he told Peter then very specifically, if you read it, that he was not talking about food or animals. He was talking about the Gentiles. Don't you call any human being common, which would be unclean. All right, that they have a right to accept Christ. They were talking about people. And then in, uh, in Timothy, in chapter uh, 4, is it 4? I believe it is. It states there, These that God, don't let any man judge you on meats for those things that God created to be received. A lot of it he didn't create to be received. They've got a job to do to keep the earth all swept up. All right, they're not fit to eat. Dennis from Oklahoma. I know this sounds strange, but as a child, I made a pact to give my soul to the devil. Can I go back on that pact, or have I really lost my soul? No, 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 no. Um, when, when you were a child, 
then you acted as a child. You're an adult now, so be an adult. Um, the, there is no sin unforgivable. As a matter of fact, if you accept him, if Satan comes around to collect, give him, give him the boot, all right? Take names and kick dragon, all right? Because you've got the power to do it. That's the power he gave you. Okay, Robert from California, question. Would you please explain Luke 16, 9, and I tell you make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous mammon so that when it fails, they may receive you into the, the eternal habitations. He was talking to the wicked and he was getting a little bit rough with them. He said, I'll tell you one thing, if you're not gonna change these people that are going to hell, you better really get to be good friends with them so you don't make the trip all along because you are sure as eternal going, all right? You're on your way to hell. That, that's what he was telling them. You better make the best of it while you can. Well, I didn't know Jesus, I didn't know he talked like that. Yeah, he sure did. He, he told them just exactly, okay? That was Luke the doctor. Uh, Peggy from Georgia, J please document that we were made in the image of angels. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Okay, hey, I'm out of time. I love you all a lot for a real special reason. And that is that you love our Father's Word in more depth. What's really important, not that I love you, but that he does. It makes his day. It pleases him, and he will always bless you for that. And some might say, well, he corrects me occasionally. Well, that's because he loves you. That's the way you do your children. He loves us very much, all right? Make his day. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. Know what? He will always bless you. But this is most important that you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with problems. You know why? Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. You have been viewing the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you are interested in obtaining more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer includes the Mark of the Beast audio tape, a newsletter with a written Bible study, a complete audio tape catalog, and a list of reference materials available through Shepherd's Chapel. You may request our free introductory offer by telephone. Call 1-800-643-4645, 24 hours a day to request the offer. You may also request by writing Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. We invite you to join us and serious Bible students around the world for our next in-depth Bible study, Monday through Friday at the same time. Thank you for watching and God bless you.